Welcome back for our Q&A time. And uh, our first question uh, posted is, hi, Dr. Jennings, I appreciate your wisdom on counseling topics and welcome your thoughts on healing from injustice, like from being wrongly accused and convicted of a crime or losing a business due to guilt by association with a dishonest business partner. I'm a Christian counselor and find this particular dynamic challenging to treat. I approach it therapeutically like trauma and grief because it is a loss of fairness. Your thoughts. And so um, I saw this question right before class. I wrote out a few bullet points to try to answer this. And so I think it's a, a wonderful question. And I'll just go through some steps. This will not be exhaustive. You could do an entire seminar or um, a weekend seminar on uh, how you help people deal with injustice. But um, as a therapist or a counselor, initially allow the patient to tell their story, to vent, to, uh, to, uh, and then empathize with them and, uh, and build a therapeutic alliance that you understand their, their pain and their suffering and that they can have confidence working with you. Then uh, they may need some help just organizing their thoughts, uh, real life planning, um, problem solving, prioritizing, decision making on how they deal with whatever the, the life changes that are going on in the injustice that's happened to them. Uh, and so there's a pr aspect of just doing real work to help them decide. When we're very emotional, sometimes we can't always uh, th think through. And so may start by just helping organize them with some healthy decisions and helping them process the priorities. Uh, but real healing comes by resolving the hurt, uh, the betrayal, the emotional wound that, that the injustice did to them. This requires separating the heart-mind issues from the real world outcomes. And you can say things like, regardless of whether uh, society, the courts, your family, your church ever come to understand the truth and, and they see you in a new and exonerated light, regardless whether it happens or not, don't you need to be the healthiest person you can be? Don't you need to heal? And so separating the outcomes that you have no power over, the external environmental outcomes, from the internal healing is an essential concept to get across. It's not that we're going to ignore real world. You want to be a lover of truth. You want to present the truth. You want to deal with uh, within the system whatever way you can. If you've been falsely imprisoned, you want to appeal the court. You want to bring new evidence. You want to get your freedom back. Of course, you're going to work that, that or, or whatever the issue is. But at the same time, you don't want to make your own personal healing of heart and mind dependent upon other people agreeing the church uh, the church agreeing that that you shouldn't have been disfellowshipped or whatever the issue might be so you separate those two and then begin working those issues um, and and um, yes that doesn't mean we ignore the injustice as I said okay what uh, what methods does a healthy person utilize in seeking justice so you want to help them yes you want to seek justice but what method do you use truth presented in love leaving free, you don't, you don't try to get even by using the very same methods that hurt you uh, in the first place. So I'll plant something in their house and call the police, uh, get them arrested. Okay, you know, um, you know th 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 these types of uh, things people think about and they get tempted for. We, we, we don't want to go down those. We want to use the uh, methods that, that, and then you can use scripture if they're a Christian to uh, examine um, people. Of course, Jesus but not just Jesus, Joseph. We've been talking about the injustices that he suffered and how he handled those. Daniel and his three friends, Job and others. There's many stories there to help us show how a righteous person can suffer and maintain righteousness, and that is the goal. And then one of the things that really helps Christians is um, to reframe them and see who was injured more severely. And most of my patients don't get this at first at all. Um, because they view the whole thing on a temporal, worldly plane, not a God reality-based plane. So I, I will, you know, I've, I had a patient once that came to see me, very embittered and angry. She worked uh, in a law office as a, a reception or a secretary for a lawyer, and across the hall, another woman worked for another lawyer, and uh, and my patient worked hard all day, all day hard work. The person across the hall, though, sat and played video games, did her nails, went shopping online, did all kinds of stuff like that all day. And, uh, and this person was in, it's not fair, it's not fair, this sense of unfairness, injustice, because I work and she doesn't have to. And I said, well, does, does her lack of work require you to do more work because you've got to pick up what she's not doing? No, they actually work for different people. And whether she works hard or doesn't, it has no bearing on how much work she does. It's just that she sees it and it's not fair. So I, I give an analogy. I said, well, let's, let's, let's use this analogy. Let's, let's say uh, I offered you $100 to wash my car, and you agreed to it. You said, that'd be great. I'll do that. And I give you the $100, and you never wash my car. 
How would you feel about that? Oh, I wouldn't feel good. I would feel like a thief. I feel like a cheat. I said, so what happens if you take a job to do a certain work for a certain pay and you show up and do the job, uh, take the pay, but you don't do the job? Light went off. Oh, wait. You see, you think she's got a better deal than you. What's happening to her character? What kind of person is she on the inside? Is she a person of integrity, honesty, loyalty, faithfulness? Can she be relied upon? Or is she a cheat and a fraud? Is that who you want to be? You want to be like her? Boom. No, she left there at peace. <laughs> she really did. It changed her. So one way to deal with injustice is to help have those realizations. Another is, is, is adults who have been traumatized as children, and the person who exploited and abused them did not uh, ever get caught or punished. And in the process of healing the, the childhood traumas, there's always the, the place of, are you still angry and resentful and bitter to this person? And, and the question of forgiveness of them. And there's obstacles to forgiveness. And one of the obstacles to forgiveness um, is, and, and you understand the person who's doing the forgiving, uh, their forgiving of the person doesn't change the abuser. It changes is the one who's been abused, okay? So it's about their forgiveness to bring healing. But one of the obstacles is, it, I'm not gonna let them get away with it. No one's ever caught them, no one else holds them accountable, I will hold them accountable. And, and there's this, because of the human law system, in, our, in the human law system, if you're not caught by some authority and punished in some way, then you get away with it. And that's a, a basic misunderstanding of how sin works, and so I educate them. And I give them the metaphor. I said, well, let's imagine this scenario. I said, you, I, I first asked, who do you think got damaged worse when you were being molested? You or the uncle who molested you? They always say me, always me. I said, okay, let's take that on face value. I said, now imagine this scenario. God takes you to heaven right now, and you have a conversation with God, and he says, I'm going to send you back to earth, and I'm going to give you two options. It's your, your choice. I'll send you back. Your life is exactly as I just took it. You just pick it up where I just brought you to heaven from. No changes. You just keep living your life. The other option is I'll let you trade lives with the uncle that molested you. You get to go around and molest kids and no one molests you. Whose life do you choose? 100% of my patients choose their own life. I said, but, 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 but you got damaged. And the light bulb goes off. No, when somebody exploits and, and, and does injustice to you, they can hurt you financially. They can hurt your physical body. They can hurt your emotions. They can hurt your psychology where you have all this confused thinking because of the trauma. But they cannot damage your soul. They cannot harden your heart. They cannot sear your conscience. When you, when you uh, practice evil against another person, you damage the inmost sacred spaces of your being. And that's the difference. Once people realize that, they go, I don't have to hold them accountable. We can't. No one ever gets away with it. You never get away with it. There's always scars and damage and wounds. To this. I mean, you keep persisting in it. Well, and they will say, well, they don't seem to be bothered by it. They're, they don't seem to be guilty. Yeah, think that through. People say that and go, is that a sign that they're not damaged or really damaged? If you can molest a kid today and then go home and sleep tonight without any difficulty, is that a sign you have no damage or that you're really damaged? <laughs> yes. So that's only more evidence that this person is severely damaged inside. Do you want to be like that? And when people recognize that, they can surrender that. And so these are some of the uh, tools. And then, of course, seek God's intervention and will. Surrender outcomes to him. Living one's life and governance of self in the healthiest way possible. But then how it turns out, I mean, where, where does God want me? What purpose does he have? And the, again, in the life of Joseph, God had a purpose for Joseph. It took, took 13 years from the time his brother sold him at age 17. He becomes the, uh, the, the prime minister of Egypt at age 30. So it was a 13-year journey before he ultimately saw the outcome that God had for him. All right, uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, this, uh, if the prophecy of Ezekiel 18 uh, about the king of Tyrus is referring to Lucifer, who is the second prophecy about Sidon referring to? I actually don't know. I haven't really studied this particular prophecy to run that out. I would, I would refer you to just standard Bible um, um, commentaries and, and research. I would have to do the research to discover that. But I've never studied that particular prophecy to know. How can I explain God's regret at creating mankind, Genesis 6.6, 6, from a design perspective, given that the plan of salvation was established as soon as the fall happened? And my view of that is that it was grief being expressed there. And I uh, paraphrase that in the remedy, uh, Genesis, which is on our website, uh, and it reads this way. This is Genesis 6.6. 6. The Lord grieved at, at their suffering, and his heart ached over humanity's terminal condition. He also grieved at the action 
His love must take in order to slow the spread of sin and keep open the avenue for Messiah to come and save the human species. So he, 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 he grieved or was, was heartbroken at the situation and what it required him to do. Um, I don't believe that he actually re regretted making mankind. Uh, I uh, said, when reading the sixth volume biography of Ellen White by her grandson, Arthur White, I noticed Ellen White would often say she put on the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11 to 17. This is so we can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. I wonder if sometimes walking away from an adversarial situation can also mean that we stand firm. Not walking away in defeat, but leaving because one has enough self-respect to not participate once a situation or organization has become toxic. What Bible verses can you suggest that would be, would, would be good to apply? I hope your answers will help others. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And there's a couple of Bible verses popping in my mind. One is that Jesus told his disciples, if you go in to share um, the message and they don't want you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Uh, one I even like better is don't cast your pearls before swine, lest they turn and rend you as hunter. Notice, don't, he doesn't say don't cast your refuse, your disdain, your disgust, your hostility, your vitriol. Don't cast your pearls, your pearls of truth and love before the swine, those that don't want to hear it because they'll turn on you. And so I think both of those are the wisdom of knowing when to speak and when not to speak and when to leave. And I think that's exactly right. But given what we talked about today, um, and since you mentioned Ephesians 6, 11 to 17, I think it'd be really nice in this time and what we just talked about in class, I'm going to share with you um, uh, Ephesians 6, 11 to 17 from The Remedy uh, about putting on the armor. Arm your minds with God's complete set of armor so that you can join the ranks of Christ's soldiers and stand successfully in the face of the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood with man-made weapons, but against all individuals, entities, and powers that misrepresent God in darkened minds, and against Satan, the originator of lies about God, and his cohorts, who also misrepresent God in the heavenly realms. Therefore, arm your minds with, the full, with God's full set of armor, so that when Satan's grand deception comes, and it seems the heavens are about to fall, you will be able to stand. And when you have done everything to present the truth and expose Satan's lies, don't falter. Stand. Stand firm with the truth of God wrapped around you like a belt, with righteous Christ-like character developed within like a breastplate, and the peace that comes from accepting the good news about God like track shoes providing good traction and a solid foundation. Also hold fast to the shield of trust which extinguishes all the burning fear and insecurity brought by the devil's temptations. Take with you the helmet of a healed mind, a mind protected from the assaults of Satan, and attack the lies about God with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the truth. And talk with God with an enlightened mind intelligently on all occasions about all your concerns, requests, plans, and issues. I thought that was uh, very um, appropriate for what we talked about today. It's time. Arm your minds. Stand firm in the face of all the assaults that are happening. Uh, somebody... Uh, wrote in, are you going to have a PDF of all you said today, not just the lesson part? Please do. It's so good. Yes. So when Dean posts the notes in the PDF form with today's lesson, it will be today's lesson, but all that I went through with the references will be there. What is your comment about not having bodies stacked up outside hospitals right now? Is this evidence of vaccination success? So my, my view is that there's a combination of effects. One, there are uh, estimated 100 million people that have recovered. The illness itself was never that virulent, ever. We would, not, we would not have had bodies stacked up had they never done anything. I will just tell you, the illness itself is proven to be not that virulent. It is contagious, not virulent. So um, my view is that we're dealing with an illness. It's not bubonic plague. Bubonic plague, if you don't treat it, we have antibiotics, antibiotics now to treat that. It's a bacterial infection, Yersinius pestis that come from uh, rats. But, but if, if you live in a place where they don't have antibiotics, uh, the death rate from black, uh, black death, bubonic plague, 100%. 100% of people get it die. Nobody survived. This is not what we're dealing with. It's not Ebola, I think 70% of people die if you get Ebola. Even with treatment, 70% die. 70%, 7 out of 10. It's not that. In every age group, it's less than a percentage. 
over 99% of all age groups survive. So this was never one of these lethal pandemics that it's been presented to be. That doesn't mean that some people don't die of it. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't help those people or do things to help protect them. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it was never something that was going to wipe out our population. As a business owner, my company, by complying with state and local mandates or executive orders that I believe are untrue, and I falsely, am I falsely representing Satan's methods? This is a great question, and this is where you need to talk and pray about it. Um, uh, and and for, for me, the question is, are we supporting practices that coerce other people? Do we surrender our decision-making to other people? There are certainly things we can go along with that we disagree with. They're not an issue of conscience. There certainly are many things we can go along with that are not issues of conscience. Speed limits. They're not issues of conscience. There are many things we do in society that you may not agree with. That speed limit's too slow. I can definitely go faster here. I know none of you ever do that. <laughs> but they're not issues of conscience. Putting something into your body, though, is. Yeah, just, just remove for a second the question of the injection. And, and how about this? You're, you're, you or your college student is going to college this fall, and they tell you you can't enroll unless you eat one piece of pork. <laughs> just have to eat one piece. If you don't eat one piece, you can't go to school here because you're going to Arkansas Razorbacks, and we all eat a piece of pork. <laughs> <laughs> now, would you, tell, would you do it? Would you say, no, uh, my, my body is a temple. I wouldn't put, put, put pork in it. Which do you think has more potential to harm you, one piece of pork or this experimental injection? <laughs> the data would suggest the experimental injection is much more likely to harm your spirit temple than one piece of pork. Or how about not one piece of pork, one glass of wine, <laughs> one shot of vodka, smoke one cigar. I bet most Adventists wouldn't do any of that. I'm not going to school here. So uh, it's a great question. I think each person has to make a decision on their own or where you draw the line on what crosses what you think is reasonable accommodation to the state and what crosses the line of conscience. How can I know if I'm saved? Every time I sip a beer or mutter the wrong thing, I'm left wondering. So what is salvation? Change your heart. It's a change of heart. It really is, have you died to self, and do you love God and others more than self? Revelation describes, and, uh, these are they who do not love their life so much as to shrink from death. I will tell you, um, having a beer is not going to keep somebody out of heaven. In fact, go to Deuteronomy 14, and you can read where God tells them to take the tithe and buy strong fermented drink and rejoice before the Lord. You can read in Proverbs where the, where the writer of Proverbs uh, in 31 said that give beer, and wine, and give beer to those who are perishing. They may forget their misery. It depends on how much you drink and why you drink. Paul told Timothy to have a little wine for his stomach. People, uh, Adventists want, that, want, want to believe that's, that's, that's grape juice. It's very unlikely. His stomach was upset because they didn't have water sanitation systems, and he was traveling. He was getting dysentery. And this is why the, the British and other sailing organizations that sent people all over the world gave their, um, their, their um, sailors grog to drink. It was a very low 3 to 5% alcoholic beverage because it killed all the bacteria and pathogens that would get in the water that they would pick up so they wouldn't have sickness and dysentery all the time. It was a medicinal. This is what was happening. They weren't drinking. Uh, uh, Paul wasn't telling Timothy to go get drunk. He was telling him, take some medicine and stop being sick all the time. So the, so it, the motive and the purpose of it to me, so I tell you, to me, it's, it's an issue of the heart. I will tell you this much. This goes to Romans chapter 14. Should I eat meat offered to idols or not offered to idols? And the problem was there were people feeling very guilty about eating meat they bought in the meat market because after they bought meat in the meat market, the meat that was uh, offered, uh, which was butchered and sold in the meat market, had been from animals that were, were slaughtered in a pagan sacrifice to the pagan god. 
And they were afraid that if they eat the meat that was offered to the pagan sacrifice, that somehow they're honoring the pagan god, and the pagan god has power over them. And Paul said, let every person be fully persuaded in their mind. Those with great faith, they can eat all that meat and won't bother them. Those with weak faith, don't eat the meat. Just eat only vegetables. Why? Because if your faith is weak, it means that you don't recognize that an idol is just a piece of wood, a piece of stone. It has no power to change the nutritional value of that food. Those with great faith, they understand that reality, and they can eat it. It doesn't bother them. But if your faith is weak, and you eat the meat, and then you begin worrying, oh, no, is that, is that, oh, no, I just saw a shadow. Does that mean there's a demon here from that God? He's coming to harass me. And it's your superstitious thinking, the idea that gets in your mind from it, that is the problem. And if your faith is weak, don't eat it, because you don't want to have all those worries, anxieties, and superstitious thinking. Keep your conscience clear. So he's saying, don't go against your own conscience. If your conscience tells you it's sin and wrong to have a beer, then you better not have a beer. because you'll feel guilty and you'll damage yourself. That's what it means, every person be fully persuaded in their own mind, so to thine own self be true. So you need to live up to the light that the Lord has led you into your life at this point in time, because if you don't, you damage yourself. So that's how I understand that. All righty. Oh, ta here's one. Um, there's a quote that somebody just put on our questions. Um, by somebody named Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky? Dostoevsky? I can't say it. It's a Russian author, I believe. And the quote is... Dostoevsky. What? Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky? Dostoevsky. Thank you. <laughs> Tolerance will reach such a level that intolerant people will be banned for thinking so as not to offend the imbeciles. <laughs> say that again. Yeah. Tolerance will reach such a level that intolerant people will be banned from thinking so as not to offend the imbeciles. <laughs> and, and what that would mean would be things like, if you were to suggest that there's actually male and female and gender is not something you choose, you're intolerant. And you can't say that. That's wrong. This is the idea. So that, uh, that we only tolerate things, this is, goes back to the three lies that we talked about, the three untruths, that, uh, that uh, anything that offends or hurts me makes me weaker. And so you can't say things that challenge somebody else's idea um, because it will, uh, and, and what happens when you live that way, you become an imbecile, you can't think. So uh, this is really brilliant, really. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the truths you revealed to us. The, the wisdom from on high. We ask that it will be part of our minds, hearts, characters, and that we can live it out effectively and give our friends around the circle here that are in real world situations having to decide where do they comply, where do they stand up and say no. I'm not going to do that. And then strengthen them to know how to say no in the most gracious and loving way possible that the truth can come back to bear. So many minds now are just completely uh, seduced into surrendered thinking to some authority and are not thinking for themselves. We just ask that so we can be useful to present your truth and love to set more minds free. We pray in your holy name. Amen.